The scene was of the Turkalize Kingdom and the Adventurer's Guild, where the receptionist stated that out of all listed jobs, it was tamer. He asked the protagonist if he knew that in that world, there were many different kinds of monsters that existed, and to tame those monsters, or in other words, to make a contract with the monster and use them as a familiar could be called a tamer. The protagonist replied positively as he knew that. The receptionist then asked him if he knew what a tamer does. The protagonist answered that to fight alongside their familiar, and also for intelligence support. The receptionist wondered if he knew that much, so he asked him another question, if he was a tamer when he did not even bring one monster there. He further stated that whatever he was saying was not even a work, and he could not register at that guild. The protagonist replied that he was a tamer who could tame a monster called Phantasma. He believed that the receptionist could not see it, then his familiar was there. The protagonist then introduced his familiar as a fire spirit named Claire. The receptionist, being angry, asked him to stop, but the protagonist still told him that there were also two phantasma and right then they were waiting at home. The receptionist asked him to just leave, to which the protagonist agreed. The protagonist introduced his job as a tamer, but the phantasma that he could make a contract with was a race whom ordinary people could not see or hear. For that reason, no matter which guild he went to, they did not believe him and ended up like that. Meanwhile, the crowd over there in the guild started wondering if he just stated Phantasma or something and if he was perhaps a rumored incompetent tamer, and if he meant that he had an invisible monster since one of the people from the crowd claimed that he heard that someone from another country. And without the protagonist even realizing, there was also that rumor spreading around. Out of nowhere, a girl jumped over there, she screamed out that it was not a lie. The girl was a phantasma fire spirit named Claire. She stated to the protagonist that the guilds everywhere just stated the same thing and pushed him away. The protagonist replied that it could not be helped as there was a limit to how much he could explain with words. Claire clarified that it was not like it could not be helped, she was just too furious to keep getting the same response every time. She then wondered what was wrong with those people who were saying that Kohaku, the protagonist, was a liar and incompetent, since they must be the ones who spread the rumors. Kohaku smiled. He cleared that because Claire gets angry on his behalf like that, he could finish that without getting angry. He then thanked Claire for the help. Claire smirked that it was good grief, but she advised Kohaku that he should get angry a little for his own sake. Kohaku was happy to contemplate that she was calming down. Besides that, Claire asked Kohaku what he was going to do then since he had already been rejected by all guilds in the country. Kohaku asked her back what he should do. Claire held on for a second and busted out on him as she herself did not know what to do. Kohaku got scared to see her mad. She further asked him why he stuck to tamers. She told him that if he pretended to be a fire magician, they would let him join the guild and she also claimed that as long as she was there, it was not impossible either. But Kohaku asked her to not do that as he believed that if he lied about his occupation, he would get caught. Claire got pissed. She walked forward by stating that the humans were too obsessed with their divine jobs. Kohaku agreed with her. He stated that the world was holding divine job supremacy principle. It was the simple rule that if it was a good job, he would get good pay. Also, if it was a bad job, he would get the cold shoulder, and that was how someone rated in an easy-to-understand way, both in a good and bad sense. Hold on. If you guys are loving this video, make sure to comment, we are loving it, because that is how I get to know that. Now, getting back to the story. However, that was the world Kohaku was born into. He had no choice but to live by the rules, and he was trying harder and harder as he believed that if he did that, then he was sure one day he would make it count. The scene then shifted to Kohaku's home where the other two phantasma were present. One was a girl, named Marionette Sufia, and another was a divine wolf, named Fenrir. They both welcomed Kohaku, addressing him as their master. Marionette Sufia gave Kohaku his clothes, and on the other side, Fenrir being excited asked Kohaku how it was. Kohaku apologized to him, but he failed again that day. Fenrir then gave a warm hug to Kohaku. He calmed him by stating that as long as he was together with him, he was happy anywhere. Kohaku also got emotional. He thanked him, and to see that scene, Claire was seen happy as she was smiling to see them like that. Suddenly, Sufia was seen burying her face into the clothes. Claire asked her if she was okay as she was sniffing a lot. Sufia asked her casually what she was talking about. Claire yelled that just then she was burying her face in it. Sufia replied that it was only because she has been having such a delusion on a daily basis, and it just looked that way. But, Claire declared that she had no such delusion. Sufia smirked. She stated that Claire was having another delusion then. Claire kept denying that she did not have any delusion and she claimed that Sufia was so infuriating. Fenrir then asked Kohaku what he was going to do then. Kohaku replied that he went to all guilds in the whole kingdom but none of them accepted him. 
as he was thinking about something. Just then he asked everyone that if they were okay with it. He was thinking of going to another country. Fenrir confirmed from him that in other words they were moving out. Sufia continued that they were moving to another country. Kohaku replied positively, stating that if it was a guild from another country, there might still be some hope. He was then contemplating that the rumors were probably already circulating in the country's bordering Turkali's kingdom, then a country that was a little far away, but does not know about him. Afterwards, he disclosed that he was planning to go to the kingdom of Brumund. Claire further confirmed from Kohaku that Brumund Kingdom was a place where there was a guild of tamers. Kohaku agreed with her. Fenrir rubbed his face against Kohaku and claimed happily that he would go anywhere Kohaku goes. Sufia also declared that she would accompany him and she requested him to take her wherever he want. Just then Claire too screamed that she would go with him too. To see that, Kohaku became happy and he thanked them. He then asked everyone to get prepared right away as they would depart the next morning. Everyone were being too excited instantly agreed to him. After a while, someone came to the place of Kohaku where Sufia told that their master had then given up on Turkali's kingdom and made the decision to relocate to the kingdom of Brumund. There were a number of people who visited there after hearing the news of Kohaku leaving the country. Out of those people, a girl disclosed that Kohaku was the only reason she moved all the way to that remote country. Another person further stated that as for him, he was already revered by that country as a god and he had given blessings to a few people himself. Sufia requested all to calm down. She again clarified as she stated before. Their master had given up on that country as in other words she made it clear that not only that country failed to see the qualities of their master, they even pushed him to make the tough decision to leave the country to all. She then asked them if they have any lingering feelings towards that country that had cornered their master to that point. Everyone replied negatively. The next morning, the scene shifted to the Turkali's kingdom. Inside the kingdom, the king was shocked to hear that no oracle from Gaia. He further confirmed from his assistant if he gave the offerings. The assistant replied positively, but he also said that when the time came, nothing happened. The king understood what the assistant was saying, but he asked him to keep his faith and not let up until he received the oracle from Gaia. Out of nowhere someone ran into the kingdom. He was panting who came with information that there was an emergency. The king was pissed, stunned to see what was with all the fuss. The person disclosed that their guild's most powerful warrior sword saint had become completely unable to use his skills. The king remained astonished, he asked if it was psychogenic. The person replied negatively. He further revealed that the warrior only stated that he could not use it all of a sudden. The king was in disbelief, he claimed that it could not be true. He wondered how a skill which was the power of the spirit could become unusable and he could not understand what was going on there. The person further disclosed that the water quality was rapidly deteriorating, and the cops were also dying. And another person added that their guild saint had lost her power, their guild's great magician too and even their alchemist. The king was asking them to wait, but they still kept telling that the air was becoming polluted, and there were reports of hordes of demons pouring in. The king, being in shock, asked them to not say it all at once. The scene then shifted to another place where Gaia was seen with some people. A guy asked Gaia what was wrong when he noticed him thinking about something. Gaia replied that she forgot to state her last greetings to the head of the church. The guy told him that it would not be necessary though, since the moment they left that country. That country was doomed to destruction. That was why he stated that it would not make a difference if she greeted them or not. Gaia understood, and she agreed with that guy. He then further stated that he also confiscated all sword skills that he gave to humans so the country that wronged Kohaku would have no need for it. But besides that, he declared that all they had to do then was to go with Kohaku wherever he goes. That was why he asked to leave everything else behind. The scene then switched up to the forest where Kohaku was seen resting with others. The very next morning, Kohaku holding the map claimed happily that he could see it. And they all moved towards the capital of Bruman Kingdom, Alex. Claire claimed that it would work that time, so she asked Kohaku just to be confident. That was how they arrived at the capital of the Bruman Kingdom, Alex. In the next scene, Kohaku was being interrogated by a person, where he was introducing himself as Tamer Kohaku, who was wishing to join the Tamer's Guild. He disclosed that he came there from Turkali's kingdom to emigrate. He stated that his entry clearance and immigration papers should have been completed. The person asked Kohaku if there were any demons he was currently taming. Kohaku smiled. He contemplated that the person could not see them obviously. He took a pause for a while, and then answered negatively that there was none right then. As he said that, Claire screamed from behind. But Kohaku was pondering that he would be more likely to believe it if he stated that there was none. But he was sure he would be disappointed to know that he could not even bring a demon with him. 
on the other side. The others were making fun of him, saying that he was incompetent and a liar. The person who was interrogating then asked Kohaku if he was just getting started with the taming. So he welcomed him to Alx and greeted him happily, to which Kohaku was wondered. In the very next moment, when he was moving ahead, he was surprised since he had not heard that word in a long time. He thought that the person probably found him weird. Just in the middle of his thoughts, Sufia called him to show him the shortest route to the guild. He smiled and appreciated that it was expected of her. He thanked her. Sufia became super happy that Kohaku praised her. But Kohaku was sure that this was a country that did not know about him, and with that thought, he kept moving ahead. He calmed himself down, thinking that it would be okay that time for sure. Finally, he arrived in front of the guild's gate. When he walked inside, he wondered to see that everywhere he looked, there were demons and demons. He stated as expected of a specialized tamer's guild. He did not see many demons in Turkali's kingdom, but he guessed that it varied from country to country. The other people present there wondered what was happening and he asked someone why he was trembling. Kohaku, on the other hand, knew that humans could not see Phantasma, but they were able to see them if they were demons. He then remembered an incident when he was in the forest where there was something hiding itself. Kohaku wondered if that was why, like they were Phantasma, it was surprising to see them. Sufia stated that it was one thing, but she claimed that Phantasma were the highest species of demons and other demons were afraid of them. She further stated that she had never heard a word about being scared since normal demons could not speak, so they had no choice but to show it like that. Kohaku apologized for that thing as he was scared of it. He then offered an apple to it and grabbed it. That was how Kohaku and that thing became happy. The scene again shifted back to the guild where Kohaku went to the receptionist, where he asked to register himself as a member. The receptionist asked him to wait for a moment. Kohaku was contemplating that he would leave as soon as he was done. Just then, the receptionist came back apologizing to him for keeping him waiting. She then greeted him, introducing herself as the Tamer's Guild staff member named Syria. She confirmed from Kohaku if he was registering that day. Kohaku also introduced himself and greeted her back, as his voice was kind of shivering while talking to Syria, which he found weird and feeling so embarrassing. Furthermore, Syria showed some ball-like structured objects and requested Kohaku to touch them. Kohaku had a look at once, and he asked what that was. Seria explained that it was a recently developed crystal, being a tamer type and number of demons that could be tamed. It would automatically display it. She also claimed that this guild was the only place in the world where it existed. Kohaku thought for a moment, and then asked if he could find out what demons could be tamed. She replied positively as it could be done with that crystal. She further disclosed that even if he tried to lie, they would know immediately. To hear that, Kohaku remained quiet. After a while, Seria asked him if something was wrong. He replied negatively, and in the very next moment, he was thinking about touching that crystal. He could not believe what he had been looking for so much there. On the other side, Fenrir asked him to throw it. But Claire was getting angry at Fenrir, stating that he was being loud. She then motivated Kohaku to just give it a go. Sufia also asked to see if they could really find out. Kohaku then stepped forward to touch that crystal, and he finally touched it. As soon as he touched that, it blew up the light and it started shining. To see that, Claire stated that it was not as much as her, but she found it pretty. Fenrir became excited to see it. He was asking if he could eat it. And Sufia was also amazed to see how beautiful it was. Kohaku smiled. He asked everyone to just calm down. Afterwards, Seria told Kohaku that he could let go of his hand. She noticed that there were three golden lights over the crystals. She disclosed that they would use that light to analyze Kohaku's information as a tamer, so she requested to wait for a moment. When she opened the book and read it, she remained astonished as she was in disbelief and all of a sudden, she screamed that he was a phantasma tamer. Everyone out there in the guild was alert when she shouted. Kohaku, being nervous, replied to her positively that he was the same. In the very next moment, Kohaku and Seria were seen in the reception office, where Seria bent to apologize to him for raising her voice in front of a lot of people. Kohaku, being friendly, asked her why she did not sit down and talk about it. She thanked him and took her seat. Kohaku then asked her why she was surprised since he thought that she would know if she had those crystals. Seria replied that the light on the crystal changes color depending on the demon that could be tamed. She further said that, for example, red was for beasts, purple for insects, green for naturals, black for dragons and so on. But she apologized because the color of Phantasma had been a mystery until then. Kohaku asked her what was next. She then showed that the golden light was not even mentioned in the instruction manual. 
Kohaku wondered if there was an instruction manual too. She further said that it was the undiscovered phantasma. That was why she thought that he was a phantasma tamer. So she again apologized to him. Kohaku smiled. He mumbled that she said sorry too much. He then revealed to her that it was true that he could tame Phantasma. Seria, being energetic, claimed that she already knew it. Moreover, she stated that by the number of lights, he had already tamed three. She then asked him where they were right then. Kohaku pointed towards the empty area that there were those tamed three. She confirmed it with excitement. On the other side, Claire wondered to Seria what was with that woman. Sufia stated since she was being over-familiar, she asked if she should deal with her. Suddenly, Seria started laughing horribly, to see that Sufia remained stunned and Fenrir in a rush hid behind the sofa. Claire, also being afraid, stated that Seria was creepy, and Sufia asked Kohaku to get rid of her. But Kohaku asked them to just stay calm. Kohaku called Seria, and she apologized to him. She revealed that she was a demon maniac. She said that when she heard about new species, she became like that. She then came back to her place and Kohaku understood that she was that kind of person. He further stated to her that he was glad she recognized him as a phantasma tamer, but he asked how did he prove that everyone was there. Seria replied that it would be easy. She gave him the solution that he just had to fight the guild master. In the next scene, it was the scene of Bruman Kingdom Arena where Seria introduced Kohaku to the guild master of the tamer guild, named Toa Iriam. Toa greeted Kohaku. She started to see if Kohaku was the phantasma tamer. Kohaku also introduced himself. Toa smiled. She clarified to Kohaku that there was no need to be afraid since she called him a cute child. Kohaku opposed that he was not a child. He claimed that he would be 20 that year. Toa again stated to him that for her he was still a child. Kohaku mumbled that she was looking about the same age as he did, and yet that seemed an intimidating presence. Since Kohaku knew that there were tamers who were tamer instead of the familiar, but Toa's was definitely a strong tamer herself, he kept reminding himself that Toa was strong. Fenrir complimented Toa that she smelled good. Claire stated for Toa that she was pretty good. Sufia asked if she was scared, calling her a flying bug. Claire, being angry, replied to her that it was forbidden to call spirits flying bugs. She asked her if she wanted to turn her into scrap. After hearing their non-stop conversation, Kohaku furiously stated how barbaric it was since everyone got carried away just because Toa could not see them. But their fight was still on. Claire was threatening Sufia to get over there, and just then Fenrir jumped over there. Kohaku requested them to not run around Toa. He further stated that it was his once-in-a-lifetime shot to get a job there for him. That was why he called everyone. Toa surprisingly asked Kohaku what he was doing. He replied that he was just calling everyone who was hanging around her. To hear that, she remained astonished that Phantasma really was invisible. Kohaku sighed with relaxation because Toa also believed in him. Furthermore, Toa was ready to introduce her demon. She extended her arms to call her demon. She called him by name, Crush. Since Phantasma did not show themselves in front of people in public's eyes, it was doubtful they even existed. But dragons were visible to everyone and easily seen to be real because they were real, and everyone unanimously stated that the strongest creature of all was the dragon. To see Toa's dragon, Kohaku surprisingly stated if that was the drake-type dragon. Toa commented that he had studied well. She agreed with him that the child was a drake-type dragon and they called that amazing kid the black dragon. Kohaku claimed that he knew about the Black Dragon. There was class among the dragons, like Drake, Hydra, Vritra, Mashasu, Wyvern, Dragonet, and Drake sits at the top although there was also class among the drakes. The normal ones were grey, and there were others that were called the colored red, blue, green, yellow, white dragon and then, black dragon which was the strongest type of the drakes. Among them, black dragon was extremely tough and ferocious or in other words, a genuine monster. When others except Kohaku saw the black dragon, Fenrir addressed him as a lizard. Claire wondered and called him a noisy reptile while Sufia asked Kohaku to let her destroy it. Kohaku asked everyone if they were confident that they could beat the dragon one on one. They saw the dragon. Fenrir replied to Kohaku being too chilled that it was so easy. Sufia also replied positively that it would be no problem and Claire was that confident that she claimed she would have trouble cutting radish with a knife which showed that it was so easy a task for her. Kohaku understood everyone's replies and he decided to go with Claire. He asked Claire to do it that time. As soon as Claire heard his decision, she excitedly asked to leave it to her and she claimed to give him a good show. Sufia called Claire a flying bug. She warned her that she would not forgive her if she gave them a shabby performance. Claire made fun of Sufia calling her a puppet. She teased her by asking not to get upset just because she did not get picked. Afterwards, Claire was coming while singing. Toa asked Crush if there was an opponent. 
The dragon was staring at Claire and Claire found it so cute, she asked if it was trying to intimidate her. Kohaku was cheering up Claire, and Toa asked him what kind of phantasma Claire was. He replied that she was a fire spirit and she was one of his three contracted demons. Toa smiled. She understood and repeated after him that she was a fire spirit. Kohaku then called Claire, but she calmed him down. She was super confident. She asked him who he thought she was, that was why she just asked him to leave it to her. Kohaku relaxed to think if Claire stated so herself. After that moment, Saria asked if everyone was ready, to which Kohaku and Toa replied positively. Saria then announced to begin the battle. Toa ordered Crush to breathe, and on the other side Kohaku was also cheering for Claire. As soon as the dragon breathed, there was fire all around that could be seen. Claire extended her hand to use her defense magic. Toa stated that a black dragon's breath vaporizes even steel but she never thought that Claire could block it. Kohaku then told her that Claire was the strongest fire elemental phantasma, making her capable of nullifying any fire attack. Claire then asked the dragon to bow its head while Kohaku asked her to not get carried away. Toa understood what was happening as it was the same she expected of phantasma. She then called the dragon, and the dragon followed her. It tried to scratch Claire with its claw, but Claire successfully defended herself. She called the dragon a naive lizard. To see all of that, Toa wondered as that was the first time when someone stopped the dragon claw. Claire then stated that it was close since if she had miscalculated her magic input, it would have been broken. And because of that Kohaku thought to scold her later. Furthermore, Toa commanded the dragon to put it on. As when Kohaku heard her, he understood and he instantly commanded to stand back. And for another time, the dragon claw got wasted. Claire survived for this time too. The dragon claw hit the ground, and Toa too appreciated what Kohaku commanded. Kohaku guessed it was an enchanting power, Toa replied to him positively. It was a special body enhancement magic that could only be used by humans and there was only one way for a demon to use that to be contracted with a tamer who could use that magic. In other words, Toa was able to use enhancement magic. Afterwards, Kohaku told Claire that it was her turn then. She again claimed to leave it to her, she breathed and smiled. Sufia was looking upward where it was seen that the dragon was in the air. Toa noticed that to block all of their attacks, a phantasma Claire used breath equivalent to that of a dragon. She wondered if it was true, but she asked if fire spirits have the power to use fire magic all they want. Kohaku replied to her that it was right and not only that, they could even freely manipulate the flame and change its temperature. He then reminded Claire that he told her to not get carried, since they specialized in heart-related abilities. Just thereafter, Toa smirked. She said that she did not expect Phantasma to be that strong, but she clarified that she still had a long way to go and she asked Kohaku if he still got two more. Kohaku replied positively. He claimed that they were about equally as strong. To hear that, Claire yelled that she was the strongest one. Sufia opposed her. She requested Kohaku for a correction that she was the strongest one. Meanwhile, Fenrir being carefree stated that he did not care as long as he was Kohaku's number one. With that, Toa cleared that there was nothing to complain about. Kohaku asked her what was next, and she extended her hand of partnership. She proposed that she would love to work together with him as a hunter in the Tamer Guild. At first, Kohaku thought for a while and he then agreed with her. That was the first step toward Kohaku's dream. The next scene then shifted to the guild master's room where Kohaku was sitting and analyzing the room. Since guild masters in Turkali's kingdom were mostly male, and there were no stuffed dolls, there was also no beautiful decoration. The smell was not even that nice and sweet but rather smelled like booze. There was even a knife stuck in the door, so that was the difference between men and women. At that very moment, Toa entered the room, she apologized for keeping him waiting. She served him a cup of drink. Kohaku thanked her. He had a look of her and he contemplated that she was so beautiful, since that was the first time a woman other than Sufia and Claire had been kind to him. As he kept staring at her, Toa requested him to not be nervous. She cracked a joke that she would not eat him after all, but Crush would probably eat him in one bite. Kohaku laughed. He commented that it was quite a joke. Toa, being serious, asked him if he thought that she was joking. An awkwardness spread for a moment there, and Toa broke the silence. She chuckled and clarified that she was joking for real. Kohaku was pondering since Toa was always smiling and never changed her expression. That was why he could not tell if she was joking or not. Thereafter, Claire asked Kohaku to have a look as it was a chocolate chip cookie and there was a lot of it. Fenrir also found them mouth-watering cookies, but Sufia stated that those two were being inappropriate. Toa noticed that the cookies were disappearing by itself. She asked if that was Phantasma's doing. Kohaku replied to her positively. He told her that everyone was happily eating it. He was sorry too that they took it without asking. 
Toa relaxed him. She stated that if they were happy with the food, she was happy too after all. She made those by herself. Kohaku was shocked to know that they were handmade. As he was just thinking of eating one, he found the plate full of cookies was empty. On the other hand, Claire and Fenrir were enjoying the cookies too much. Kohaku sadly exclaimed that they ate everything. But just then Sufia asked him to not worry since she already secured his portion. He became happy as it was expected from her. When he tasted the cookie, he screamed out of happiness that it was delicious. Toa was glad to know that he liked it. He gave her a compliment that he had never had such delicious cookies. After that moment, Toa stated that they have had a chance to relax, so she asked Kohaku if they could talk. He replied positively. She came to the main topic. She passed a kind of envelope towards Kohaku. He looked at it. He was excitedly about to guess it. Just then Toa asked him to open it. When he opened it, there was a brooch inside it and he was astonished to see that. Toa told him that it was the brooch that identifies him as a guild member of Tamer Guild. He asked if it was not that bronze plate. He further asked if the rank from the bottom was not were iron, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, mithril. Toa disclosed since Kohaku was able to fight her crush in a match so, as a special exception he would start from bronze plate. Kohaku was still in shock, he asked her if she was sure, and she replied to him positively. Kohaku realized that it was seven years he ran around to various guilds trying to get in as a tamer. He went into his flashback where he was being asked if he was not a magician, not a tamer. They told him the same thing everywhere that even the flame that he just released was exactly that of a wizard, he even being threatened to get reported for telling a lie and try to register as a tamer. In another place someone told him that Phantasma was just some imaginary creatures that did not exist in that world and that person too called Kohaku a liar tamer. After listening to Kohaku's story, Toa stated to him that perhaps everything was seven years trying to get that. He agreed with her. He said that he had made it that far because of what his dad stated. Toa wished him to do his best, and in the name of herself she asked him to accept that brooch. She claimed that she would be rooting for him and would not let anyone complain. She gave the brooch in his hand, and while she held his hand Claire yelled out of jealousy. Claire panicked and she was thinking what she should do. Fenrir was also asking to get down. Kohaku asked both of them to calm down, but they stated that he was the one who needed to calm down. Toa put her hand on Kohaku's head, she relaxed him, and asked to cry all he wanted then if it lightened his heart. After a while, she asked him if he had calmed down. He replied positively, and apologized too for the act. Claire was getting furious at Toa because of her jealousy, she stated if when would she stop patting. Fenrir stated that the person who was kind to Kohaku was a good person for which reason he liked the way Toa was treating Kohaku. Sufia also understood that but she wondered as Claire was that Toa was a bit too close to Kohaku. On the other side, Kohaku was asking Sufia and Claire to stay calm. He then thanked Toa and clarified that he was fine. Toa replied to him that if he wanted to be spoiled, then she would spoil him anytime as he wanted. Kohaku was thinking that he could not let himself be spoiled again. He then appreciated Toa's thought. Afterwards, Toa requested him to stand up and asked him to stand still. She did something on her coat. Meanwhile, he liked her smell. After she was done with that, she asked him to take a look at the mirror. When he looked at himself in the mirror, she asked him again to take a good look. And it was seen that she tucked the brooch on him to notice which Claire, Fenrir and Sufia became happy and gave him the compliments. In the very next moment, Toa told him that he could then start taking requests right away. She further requested him to go to the reception desk and get more information from Syria. Kohaku bowed in front of her and paid thanks, he also claimed to do his best. After that he asked everyone to go and they left the reception room. After a while they were now at the reception desk where Saria congratulated Kohaku on passing the exam and she proposed to work together from then on. Kohaku thanked her as he was feeling so grateful. Saria then explained about the guild, but she firstly asked him how much he knew about the work in the guild. Kohaku replied that the guild receives various requests from the public and guild members would solve them. Saria agreed with him. She stated that he was generally right. She further told him that there were various requests such as searching, gathering, and eliminating demons and since Kohaku has a bronze plate, he would mainly do searching and gathering and he could eliminate weak demons. Kohaku asked if an iron plate could not eliminate the demons. Saria said that since iron plates were still novices, they could only search and gather. Kohaku understood that was how they gradually built up their ranks from bottom. Saria then asked him if, as if he wanted, he would accept a request to eliminate demons. Kohaku replied negatively. He stated that he was already bronze, but he still did not know anything about the guild or requests so like iron plates. 
he asked to start with deer and gathering requests. Besides, he further stated that the fact that there was a request means that there was a person in need then he would like to help those people in need, even if it was just a little. Saria paused for a while. She contemplated that they have had a few bronze plate starters before in the past, but she had never met anyone like Kohaku before. She then gave him the compliment that he was truly a kind person. Kohaku noticed while Saria was thinking. She looked kind of sad just then. Saria then moved forward to explain how to accept the request. She showed him the way and asked him to follow her. After a while, they went to another area where Saria told him that gold and above requests could only be accepted at the reception desk due to its danger, but iron, bronze, and silver requests could be found there. There was a board on which Kohaku read, gathering iron mining, searching for runaway horses, investigating the colony of spider lilies, and eliminating ten goblins. And after reading all of those, Kohaku decided to do herb gathering first. Saria understood, so she asked him to go to the reception desk to confirm his application. After the process, someone took the report from Syria to Toa that he was heading out to gather herbs. Toa wondered. She stated that it was just like him to do that. And when she saw Kohaku was going through the window, she asked him to take care. After a while, Kohaku, with others, arrived in the forest to gather the herbs. Claire asked Kohaku how many herbs they needed. He replied, apparently, the more we have, the better it would be because herbs are ingredients for recovery medicines. She then asked him how they could find it since all the grass looked the same to her. Kohaku then told Sufia that it should be fine, to which Sufia also agreed. And with the help of her detection field generated, the herbs got detected. Kohaku further showed the red glowing grass there, telling them that those were the herbs they were looking for. Claire asked him if she could just pull it out. Kohaku replied positively, telling her to fly around and get a lot of herbs from up there. As per commands, Claire flew and asked him to leave it to her. A few moments later, they gathered lots of herbs in the bags from there. Meanwhile, Fenrir called Kohaku to show something. Kohaku came to him and asked what it was. Fenrir replied that this one was different from the other, and it smelled good as well. While staring at that herb, Kohaku asked Sufia what that herb was. She replied that it was a superior herb which mutates and manifests itself into a higher rank of herbs. Upon hearing that, Fenrir became happy. He asked Kohaku excitedly if he was doing great. Kohaku replied positively, appreciating that he did a great job finding it. He then suggested to separate the bags and collect that superior herb too, expressing his excitement as he stated that they could never have too many herbs. Other phantasma were also enthusiastically ready to do their best. After collecting the herbs, they came back to the Tamer Guild. Saria welcomed him back. She asked how it was or even a gathering request could become a challenge. Kohaku replied positively, telling his point of view that he could respect the iron plates for doing all of that in one day. He further asked her where he should put the herbs. Saria replied that he could just put them there, and she told that she would use her appraisal skill to appraise them. He understood and called Fenrir to come there. Fenrir followed the command, and he handed over the bags. Saria was surprised to see the bags. She asked where they came from. Kohaku replied that he had got one of his friends carrying it on his back. She then asked him astonishingly if all of those were herbs. Kohaku replied positively, asking her to not tell him that it was not enough. Saria further started to look into the bags. She remained stunned to see the herbs and superior herbs all over there. Kohaku replied positively out of nervousness. She then asked him, being confused, why there were so many superior herbs. He replied that it was hard to explain how to do it, but he told me that it was his friend's power. Saria understood as she could expect that from phantasmas. On the other side, a guy while drinking his drink was staring at Kohaku for a while. Kohaku asked Saria since superior herbs were a different item from the request, so if it was okay to pick it. Saria told him that it was alright, even though she thanked him for taking so many of them. She further disclosed that the superior herbs in particular were almost indistinguishable from regular herbs, even their collection rank had gone up. And to see a while back full of it, she could not thank him enough. Kohaku wondered to know that, but he was glad that he did it. He then requested Saria to exchange it, but she replied since there were a number of them, so it might take some time. She asked him if that would be alright with him, and he agreed upon it. Meanwhile, Fenrir and Sufia were hearing Kohaku's conversation from outside the room. Claire took all the credit for those herbs happily. Sufia corrected her, stating that it was them, and she called it shameless that Claire was trying to take all the credit. Claire again claimed that she was the one who flew around collecting them, which was why they got so many of them. Sufia then made her point that without her scan, she would not be able to do that either. Claire became furious, mumbling to just hit one time while Kohaku was not looking. Further on, the guy who was staring at Kohaku stood up. 
he introduced himself as Hick and declared that he would not accept a pansy like him. He went to Kohaku and called him a liar for calling himself a phantasma tamer. Kohaku clarified that he would not lie. In fact, he disclosed that Toa had already approved it. Hick threatened him, asking how dare he call the guild master by her name. In being angry, he asked his friend whose side he was on, as his friend was stopping him. Kohaku realized that Hick was too drunk to talk with, and he covered his nostrils due to the awful smell. Hick further challenged Kohaku to fight using their familiar like a tamer. Kohaku replied that personal fights between guild members were supposed to be forbidden, but Hick cleared that he did not care. Kohaku again tried to make him understand that it was forbidden, so they had to follow the rules. Hick understood. He then stated to Kohaku that he could not fight him because he did not have any demons that he was taming. Kohaku clarified that it was not that since he kept telling him that it was against the rules and that was why they could not do that. Just then, Claire asked Kohaku if she could kill Hick, Fenrir claimed that he would bite him to death, and Sufia was exclaiming to just exterminate. Kohaku then screamed aloud at Hick that he already told him, asking if he could hear what he was saying. Hick smirked, making fun of him by asking if he was scared. In the very next moment, Hick got smashed, and the attack was so fierce that he fell down on the floor. Claire exclaimed happily that it was Crush. Kohaku was surprised if she meant that it was Toa's familiar, but he seemed too small while sitting on Kohaku's hand. Kohaku wondered if it was that small before. Crush sighed that it was so cool. Just then, Toa appeared there. She asked who the idiot was making a fuss in her guild. She greeted Kohaku and asked him if he could explain. Kohaku was feeling shy. He replied positively, and further explained all of the mess that happened there. Toa understood. She declared that Kohaku was a real phantasma tamer. She also disclosed that he and Crush have fought on equal terms and she approved it. She cleared Hick that if he had any objection to Kohaku joining the guild, he could address it directly to her. Hick was trying to oppose her, but she asked if he was questioning her decision. He further tried to interrupt, and she again asked him if he was questioning her. Hick apologized to her. Kohaku felt that the pressure was strong. He then told Toa that he did not mind it as he thought that it was enough. Toa replied that she was saying that so that it does not happen again in the future, since personal fights between guild members were not allowed. Kohaku then asked her if that did not apply to her as well. Toa replied that it was an interesting thing to say. And just then, Kohaku instantly realized what he had just stated. He covered his mouth with his hands. Thereafter, Saria came. She thanked Kohaku for waiting and asked if something was wrong. Kohaku refused, stating that it was nothing. Saria told him that the exchange was complete, so she requested him to confirm it. On the other side, Toa asked Hik to talk in the other room. Saria further explained to Kohaku that there was, in addition to the requested reward, a hundred kilograms worth of herbs would be exchanged for ten silver coins and five copper coins. Kohaku asked her since they were separated by silver and copper coins, so does that mean he could collect copper coins and then exchange them for silver coins? Saria replied positively, telling that he could exchange a hundred copper coins for one silver coin, a hundred silver coins for one gold coin, and a hundred gold coins for one platinum coin. Kohaku contemplated that it means that the price for one kilogram of herbs was ten copper coins, and Saria further gave for the superior herbs, since there were forty kilograms of superior herbs for four gold coins. Kohaku remained astonished to get four gold coins as that was too much. Saria concluded that it was all of the exchange. She asked him if he wanted to take another request. Kohaku replied negatively, refusing because he was thinking about funding an inn to stay. Saria understood. She told him that if there was anything else she could do for him, she requested to let her know. Afterwards, they stepped out of the guild. Claire told Kohaku that she was hungry. Sufia asked her if she had been eating too much since they left the guild, as she had cookies and baked sweet potatoes earlier. Claire, being carefree, replied to her that it has nothing to do with that. Sufia called her fatty, and Claire instantly got triggered. Kohaku was pondering that to find out about the prices in that city. He mentioned that it was better to look around for food and general foods. But he told Claire that when they found a place to stay, he would let her eat any food she wanted, so he asked her to bear with him for a minute. Claire wondered if he was talking for real. She already expected that from him and she liked that about him. Kohaku then commanded Sufia to bring up a map and give him a reasonably priced inn in that neighborhood. Sufia showed the map. She told about an inn which had 50 copper coins per night, which looked like breakfast and dinner were included. Kohaku asked her if that was a normal price for an inn. She replied apparently there were. Kohaku took a while to think that a bronze rank who was able to take an elimination request could barely get enough to stay there. But if he was setting two meals for one night that seemed a very reasonable price to him. After evaluating, he agreed upon then and was ready to go there. 
After a while, they arrived at the inn where someone welcomed him to Florin. Kohaku asked since he would like to stay there, so if there was any room available. There was a little girl who replied to him positively. She stated that it was no problem and asked him how many nights he would be staying. Kohaku replied that he would stay there with 10 silver coins for then. The girl immediately calculated the 50 copper coins per night, 100 copper coins for one silver coin, so for 10 silver coins she stated that it would be 40 nights. Just then, her mother came and corrected her that it was 20 nights. The little girl's name was Frederica. Her mother asked Kohaku to pardon, and she apologized for that. She further asked for his name. Kohaku introduced himself, and the lady took him to show his room. She asked Frederica to take him to room 205. She took him, and after getting the room, Sufia gave Kohaku his clothes. To see that, Claire asked Sufia if she was not going to sniff it again. Sufia took a pause, and she replied negatively. Claire then asked her if what was with the pause just then she took. On the other hand, Kohaku was smiling while looking through the window. He was happy to contemplate how he was being welcomed at the guild, how Toa believed in him and how Saria proposed to him to work together. At that very moment, Claire interrupted him by asking what he was going to do the next day. He replied that he was planning to take an iron mining request in the morning, and if there was time, he was going to take an elimination request. Claire told him that if he was getting an elimination request, she wanted something that has bone as a target. Kohaku asked if she meant a target that has bones. She spoke like a dragon, but he clarified that bronze could not do it. There were two guys having a conversation. One of them told that a phantasma tamer had joined the tamer's guild. He asked what he thought. The other guy replied that if he was actually there, he would like to meet him. In the very next morning, Kohaku went to the guild where Saria was telling him that there were currently two iron mining requests, and the locations to see them would be at Blio's mine and Raisin mine. Kohaku replied that he already decided that he would go to Raisin mine. He remembered Sufia telling him that he would find good quality iron there, so he told the same to Saria, saying that his friend had informed him that the quality of iron ore there was better. Saria agreed with him, acknowledging that it was true. Moreover, she stated that they were currently experiencing a shortage of good quality iron ore, so she claimed that they would be grateful to Kohaku if he did that. But she asked him if he was sure, since he could reach Blio's mine in two days by carriage, but Raisin mine takes five days. Kohaku replied that then he had more reason to do it. He stated that now that he knew there was a shortage of good quality iron ore, he decided that he would like to help in any way he could to repay the guild that accepted him. Sufia was listening to him, and she was proud of him, so she saluted him. Kohaku then smiled, and Saria understood his intentions. Afterwards, Kohaku went back to the inn where he called Frederica. She asked him how she could help him. He told her that starting the next day, he would be away for a few days to do a request from the guild. She apologized if that was sudden, but he asked her if she could prepare some food for his trip. Frederica asked him how many he needed. He took a pause for a while to think. Sufia did not eat, so it would be three days worth of food for him, Claire, and Fenrir. He asked if 28 servings would be all right. Frederica replied positively, but in the very next moment, she realized that it was a lot, so she asked him if he was going very far. Kohaku told her that it was not that far. She then asked him if he had so much food, wouldn't it become spoiled? Kohaku clarified that it was okay because the food would be eaten in three days. Frederica was astonished to hear three days, so she clarified and asked his father first. She immediately went to her father, and after a while when she came back, she informed him that there would be extra charges, but they could make 28 servings of boxed food. Kohaku asked her how much it would cost. She started calculating that it was 25 copper for one serving, and there were 28 servings. With extra charges, the price would be 1.2 times more, so she told him that it was 8 silver and 80 copper. But her mother came and corrected her, saying that it was 8 silver and 40 copper. In the next morning, Kohaku and others reached race and mine in two hours, as expected of Fenrir. Fenrir told them that there was no unusable smell inside the cave, and there was no smell of gas. Sufia added that there was no sign of humans either. He thanked both of them and told Claire that they would need some light. As Claire set up the light, they all entered the cave. After walking inside for a while, Sufia disclosed that they had arrived, showing that it was the mining site. She then told me to generate the detection field. Kohaku further distributed the work, saying that Fenrir and he would do the digging, and he told Claire and Sufia to put the iron ore in the sack. They all energetically got engaged in the work. After a while, Kohaku exclaimed that it would be enough, and he realized that the mining was not easy. Fenrir was still digging faster and faster, and he was enjoying it. To see him digging, Kohaku thought that it might be faster if he just made Fenrir do all the digging. 
but in the very next moment, he realized that he could not do that since he was their master, so he needed to help in any way he could, and also he contemplated that he could not show them his lame side. Just then, Claire informed him that the fourth sack was already full. He wondered as that was pretty fast. At first, he assumed that it would take three days, but at that rate, he stated that they would be done by the next day and it was all thanks to them. Sufia then disclosed that there was a human presence. Kohaku looked out of shock, and she further said that it was getting closer. She claimed that they were not someone from the Tamer's Guild, but they were pretty strong. They could see the ball of light out there, and Kohaku contemplated what kind of person that would be if Sufia was saying it like that. And finally, the human came in front of Kohaku. The guy wondered to see him. Another guy asked the third one, named Cole, if he did not state that there was nobody inside. Cole agreed with him, saying that he already checked with his detection magic. But the guy clarified that there was one there, and he was talking about Kohaku. They noticed the brooch on his chest and guessed by looking at the shape that he was from the battle guild. He was then trying to see his color, but he could not tell accurately since it was too dark, so he guessed if it was silver. But he stopped as soon as he realized that he had stated too much. The guy apologized to Kohaku for startling him, and he said that they also came there to do some iron mining. He wondered if Kohaku could share some of it with them. Kohaku got nervous and showed that it was piling up over there, and if they wanted to, he told him that they could take some from there. The guys stopped for a while. On the other side, Claire and Fenrir were making noise, saying that those guys were coming in the way, and they were asking them to get out from there. One of those guys was stunned to see that it was all iron ore, while Cole declared that on the top of that, most of it was high purity. So, he asked Kohaku if he was sure that they could bring some with them. Kohaku replied positively, stating that there was no problem. The guy said to Kohaku that he had been a big help, so he requested to let him thank somehow, and he further asked if they could help with something. Kohaku noticed that the guy's face was smiling, but that was not a genuine smile. And just then, he remembered Toa telling him one thing, that she was sure that he would meet someone from the battle guild in the future, so she told him something in advance that some of their members have a short fuse. So, Toa told him that if they ever said something to him, just keep himself cool and handle it like he did just then. And in case something goes wrong, she had already told him to just run away, and they would help him. After remembering all of that, Kohaku relaxed himself. He appreciated their thought, but he told them that it was all right. From behind, Claire and Fenrir kept making noise, saying that they were in the way, and that was why they could not work like that. The guy further said to Kohaku that if he needed anything, he could stop by Alex's battle guild. He finally introduced himself as Ashur and told Kohaku to just tell them that he wanted to talk with him, and they would listen to him. That was how they stepped back from that cave, and Kohaku saw them off. He immediately bent over, wondering, and he was glad that it did not turn into a fight. Also, he was glad that they were the kind of people he could talk to, but he was so exhausted. Claire asked him to continue with the work. While walking out of the cave, Ashur stated about Kohaku's belongings that he left there. He asked his companions if they saw the plate on his jacket. Cole guessed that it was the Tamer's Guild's bronze plate. Ashur said that he heard that there was an unusual rumor about that Tamer's Guild recently, which was something about a Phantasma Tamer joining. The other guy was stunned, and he stated if that was not just some kind of myth. Ashur further stated that the fact that he was a hunter for the Tamer's Guild, moreover, he did not see any of his familiars with him, because he revealed that a Tamer could not take any requests if they did not have any familiars with them. So, the guy asked Ashur if he was saying that Kohaku was that phantasma tamer. Ashur declared that he did not have any proof though. In that case, the guy then asked if it was not better to tell him about that. Ashur refused to do that. He wanted to let them see how things went for them, since they still did not know how long he would be there. Besides, he stated that if Kohaku somehow made it to that place, then they could help him. The day passed. In the very next morning, Kohaku and his family were still engaged in working inside the cage where Fenrir was seen digging and Claire was asking him to just hold back a little. Sufia agreed with her. She added that he would end up hitting the master with dirt. Kohaku stated that it was fine since it was all thanks to Fenrir that they were progressing smoothly. Fenrir, being excited, asked Kohaku if he was doing great. He replied positively and motivated him, saying that he was doing really great. Sufia cautioned Kohaku that he was spoiling Fenrir too much. Kohaku clarified that he just wanted everyone to be at ease, but still, he apologized. Suddenly, they saw something, and Fenrir said that it opened. Kohaku asked what opened it. He disclosed that a big hole opened. They all looked inside the big hole, and to see that Kohaku guessed that they had dug pretty deep since the previous day, but it seemed that there was still more ahead. 
He then instantly said that they have collected most of the iron ore around there, so he asked how they would go there. They all agreed to him, and when they entered, Fenrir wondered to see such a huge place. Kohaku remained stunned to see what was that as there was some bunch hanging from the roof. Kohaku further stated that the place was smelling, and Sufia alerted him. Meanwhile, Fenrir claimed that he would protect his master. Kohaku pondered if they were in a situation where he needed to be protected, then he asked if they should leave. Sufia refused. She stated that by the moment they got in there, they had probably woken it up, and she suggested that it would be better if they took it down right away. All of a sudden, they realized some movement. They looked upward towards the bunch of leaves, and there was something dangerous coming out of it, which was looking horrible. When Kohaku looked at it, he was surprised as that thing showed its tongue out, which was looking too scary. On the other side, Ashur and others realized some presence. The third guy of that group wondered if Kohaku went into the dangerous zone. Cole also agreed upon him as it seemed like it. They ran inside the cave in a rush, wondering how he got to that place in just one day. Ashur understood that it should have been obvious from his behavior, as there was a number of iron ores that was not the amount one person could have done, and even though Cole did not detect it, they were sure that Kohaku had his familiarity with him. Ashur further accepted that he was wrong to think that just one day would not be a problem. He stated that if by chance he had already confronted the demons, even if he had his familiar, he could not win against it. He asked Cole and Roan to prepare to fight, and he was hoping for Kohaku just to be safe. They finally came into the danger zone too. There was something happening like destruction there. Fenrir claimed that the spider was too weak. Claire added that Fenrir alone would be enough to fight it. And Sufia asked her to not let guard down. She supposedly exclaimed while mumbling that it would be better if they both were eaten there. Claire shouted at her that she could still hear her. Sufia further teased Claire by telling her that spiders love to eat bugs. Claire got pissed and she yelled. Kohaku was laughing to see both of them like that. Just then, he noticed Ashur, Cole, and Roan there, and he seemed a little uneasy. Ashur then calmed him down that there was nothing to worry. He clarified that they did not come there to fight with him. He disclosed that they were there for that demon. He further said that this place was declared as a dangerous zone on the morning of the day they met, and they were tasked to eliminate that demon. Sufia explained to Kohaku that the dangerous zone was an area around the world that had been designated as dangerous by hunters with detection abilities. She further added that it was the places near an erupting volcano, a river with torrents too strong for humans to cross, an island where lightning falls like rain, and places where powerful demons might appear. Further on, Ashur stated that it might sound like an excuse, but he never thought that Kohaku could dig that far from there in one day. Kohaku was thinking of the last night when they were done with the mining but they decided to go deeper. The sewer then bowed in front of Kohaku. He stated to him as a result, he ended up confronting the demon so he apologized to put him in harm's way. Kohaku got nervous and Ashur kept apologizing to him. Kohaku realized that he let Fenrir get carried away even after Sufia warned him that he was spoiling Fenrir too much. He then revealed to Ashur that it all happened because he dug around too much, so he asked how about they call it even there. He seemed to be scared. Ashur passed a soft smile and told him as he thought before that he was the Phantasma Tamer. Kohaku was stammering. Ashur then relaxed him that there was no need to hide it because he had been hearing rumors about Phantasma Tamer joining the Tamer's Guild. Kohaku wondered to hear that there had been rumors like that, but he asked Ashur how he knew it was him. Ashur replied that it all started when he met him the previous day. He told me that there was a Tamer's Guild's brooch on his jacket and yet he did not see any familiar and he was convinced just a few moments ago when he saw that power that overwhelmed the giant spider. He was certain that there was something there that he could not see. To know that much, Kohaku contemplated that it might be all right to just admit it the so. He accepted that he was the Phantasma Tamer and right then he was a member of Toa's guild. Ashur became super happy. He declared that he was the real deal. He shook hands with Kohaku and wondered if he could meet the legendary Phantasma Tamer in a place like that. He asked to let him reintroduce himself. He told his name was Ashur Kreutz who was a swordsman from Battle Guild, and he introduced the other two who were also from the Battle Guild. They one by one introduced themselves as Cole Magicalia who was a magician and Roan Barrett who was a brawler. Kohaku greeted them and introduced himself as well. Still, Kohaku was surprised to see silver plates coming to the dangerous zone. He stated that the people from Battle Guild must be very high level. Cole wondered to hear the silver plate. Round then laughed. He guessed that it was hard to tell since it was pretty dark in there. Ashur then disclosed that they were mithril plates. At first, Kohaku did not react that much, but as soon as he realized the mithril plate, he was astonished to know that. Roan laughed as Kohaku finally realized it. Kohaku apologized for being rude. Ashur told him that it was alright, 
and he was planning on going to meet him later. Kohaku wondered if he would meet him. Moreover, Ashur offered him if he would join the Battle Guild. He said that the Battle Guild would be willing to offer him a yearly contract for 50 platinum coins. He also promised to Kohaku that he would be given a mithril plate if he was willing to join, and apart from that he would be paid for completing the requests. He asked what he thought about the offer. Kohaku held for a while. He then apologized but he told the reason he was there then was because Toa recognized him, and he told that there were people in the guild that were looking forward to working with him. He further added that they were the people who welcomed him with open arms and he hasn't even been able to repay them yet which was why he declared that he could not join the battle guild. Ashura understood that he had already found his place, but he was all okay with that since Kohaku's feelings were important. He just then had something to tell Kohaku that the demon there was called Death Spider, and its body was made of magic crystals. Kohaku wondered if magic crystals meant that they were different from magic stones. Cole then explained to him that magic stone was a crystallized form of magic power created inside a demon's body, and the magic crystals were the crystallized form of a magic power that leaked out when a demon died. He further added that with the magic crystal that big, most likely it contains thousands of demons' magic in it. Brown concluded that what he was saying was, it was better to take as much as he could with him. But, Kohaku asked if that was not the request that they were doing. Shur replied that he was the one who killed it, so if he brought it back with him, he could sell it for a good amount of money, or he could make a magic weapon with it. Cole called Ashur a bad person as he was testing him. Roan guessed that it was to see whether he was someone who could become blinded by money or fame. Ashur accepted that he really could not hide anything from them too. But Kohaku was not blinded by greed and followed his heart, so Ashur guessed that there was nothing to worry about. Ron then asked what he was going to do if Kohaku accepted his offer. Cole also agreed with him, since they were not allowed to poach people from another guild. Ashur was waiting if he nodded. He stated that he might get down on his knees naked and lick Guildmaster's boots to get him to accept him. Cole asked Ashur if he fell for him. Ashur replied to him positively, if he saw that power up close. Claire asked Kohaku if he was sure about that. He replied positively, he cleared that it was not like he was working for money anyway. Claire asked, being surprised if for what then he was working. He guessed that he was working to be strong, to be brave, to be righteous, to be sincere as something like all that. The next scene then shifted to the Tamer's Guild where Kohaku stated that he was back. Saria wonderfully guessed that it was Kohaku's voice. She got panicked, she asked if he was alright. Kohaku had a counter-question to her about what was wrong. She replied that two days ago, they received a report that a powerful demon might appear in the depth of Raisin Mine, and on the same day, she heard that Battle Guild's mithril hunters were sent there to take it down. Kohaku understood that she was talking about Ashura's group. Saria further stated that it was the third day since he left, as she did not know his whereabouts and she got really worried. She added that she was so worried about what would happen had he got there early and met the demon, so she asked him if he returned halfway through his trip. He did not answer her, instead he started to look somewhere else. Saria asked him why he was looking away, and abruptly she guessed if he defeated the death spider that appeared in the dangerous zone. Tohaku replied positively, but he clarified that it was not him to be exact, it was all of them. Saria understood that he made it with the help of his phantasma, and she cleared that it made no sense at all since that was not the problem there. She further asked him to listen to her carefully, though she was glad that nothing had happened that time. But she told that a hunter was a profession where death was always around the corner. It was like sharing a bed with death which was why she told him that they need to improve their ability to sense danger and critical thinking. She told him that when he felt that he was in danger, it was important to run away. She angrily claimed that his life was his and his alone and there was only one in the world. She then apologized for getting mad. In the very next moment, she got quiet and thought that she did not want to see another dying hunter. When she lifted her head up, Kohaku thanked her. She got emotional and started crying. After a while, she stood up and apologized for crying earlier, so she asked if he wanted to make a magic weapon. He replied positively. In that case, she told him just to take what he needed from the mine materials and they would deliver the rest. Kohaku then decided to take some of the iron ore and magic crystal. Saria wondered about the magic crystals. He explained to her that those were iron ore for the request and those were the magic crystals that he took after defeating the death spider. Saria took some magic crystals and she was stunned since all of them were of high quality and purity. She called him master at that. Moreover, she said since there were so many of them, she requested to give her two hours to appraise them, so she told him to feel free to go ahead and get the other things done if he has any. Afterwards, Kohaku with his familiar left the guild. While walking out, Sufia told him that there was a blacksmith town called Flamon in the southwest direction from there, 
and there was a man in that town called Zacchaeus who was considered to be the best blacksmith in the country. Kohaku thanked him, and he wondered what kind of person Zacchaeus was. Moreover, Sufia told him that a magic weapon was a weapon that contained magical power as she gave an example. A sword that had a fireball embedded in it would be able to shoot fireball without using any mana when he swung it. But first, she suggested to him that it was important to choose the right weapon for him. Kohaku understood, he stated that there were a lot of kinds of weapons and if he could not use it properly himself, then it would not help, so he guessed something like a great sword or knife. She agreed with him, therefore, she told him that after analyzing and calculating the master's growth rate, and other various factors, she believed a one-handed sword would be the best choice. Afterwards, they arrived at the blacksmith town Flamel. As they looked all around, Claire commented that this place was so nice and lively, and she just loved towns with that kind of energy. Kohaku agreed with her as it made him excited as well. Abruptly, his eyes got attention towards the crowd over there. He wondered why there were so many people over there, so Claire suggested going to have a look. When Kohaku walked forward, Sufia told him that it was a magic weapon. There was a person standing there holding a sword in his hand, and it seemed like he was about to slice up the wooden log that was put there. Next up, the person took his position as he was ready to use his weapon, and it just burned the surface without using any magic to see which everyone was celebrating, and Kohaku remained amazed. He found it so cool. Claire excitedly exclaimed that even she could do that. Sufia replied to her that if she was a fire spirit and she could not do that, then she was nothing more than a flying bug. Kohaku asked both of them to stop fighting and told them to go to Zakus's place quickly. A guy noticed Kohaku and wondered if he had just started Zakus. After a while, they arrived at Zakus's place. The guy was thinking if Kohaku was that Zakus's person's blacksmith. Further on, Claire asked Kohaku if it was not looking run down. He replied that she just did not understand, as that was what people call charm. He went to the door and knocked, asking if Zakus was there. Nobody answered, so Claire guessed that he might not be at home. Sufia opposed her, she disclosed that there was human presence inside. Kohaku then checked the lock of the door and found that it was not locked. He opened the door and apologized to Zakus if he was currently on break, but he clarified that he wanted to make a request for a weapon. He saw that it just boomed something. There was a hammer which struck the wall. The person asked Kohaku who he was. The person, having a beard, was holding a bottle and was staring at Kohaku. Kohaku then told him that he was there to make a request for a new weapon, and he introduced himself as Kohaku from Alex Tamer Guild. After having a sip of water from the bottle, he just tossed the bottle on the table. Kohaku got scared. The person then asked him if he was a hunter. Kohaku replied positively, and said that it was indeed what he needed. Just then, the person interrupted him in the middle. Kohaku got quiet for a moment, then asked him if he was Zakus. The person accepted that he was Zakus. Kohaku further asked if they could talk, but Zakus just ordered him to go home without listening to him. Zakus turned behind and grabbed the weapon while saying that from the bottom of his heart, the hunters were the people that he hated the most. He was boiling with anger, and he just threw the weapon towards Kohaku, causing Kohaku to fall outside the place. But his familiar had made the defensive field for him already. Claire yelled furiously, asking what was wrong with that guy. Sufia asked Kohaku if he was alright. Kohaku, while bowing his head, replied positively in a very low sound. Sufia understood that he was not alright, so she was trying to cheer him up. Claire agreed with her, stating that they did not have to rely on that guy anyway, as she was sure that there were better blacksmiths out there. Fenrir also got angry. He asked if he should go bite him to death, but Kohaku asked him not to do it. They all then went to the Flamon bar. Claire and the other familiars were having a conversation where Claire stated that Kohaku really wanted him to make it. Sufia added that it could not be helped since he was the best blacksmith in the country. The three of them were looking at Kohaku, who was sitting with his head down. Kohaku was crying terribly, contemplating why Zakus hated hunters so much. Another guy came to him, asking if he was a customer of Zakus. He further stated that he knew Kohaku had just been turned away and was in the middle of getting drunk, but he suggested that it would be better if Kohaku gave up on him. Kohaku asked who he was. He then introduced himself as Katori. Kohaku told Katori that he heard that Zakus was the best blacksmith in the country. Katori told him that even the most skilled craftsman in the country would say that his sword was one of the best out there. Back then, he disclosed, his sword would be worth one platinum coin per piece. Kohaku was stunned to know the prices. He then told Katori that he would like to see it, so he asked if there was any chance of it still being sold somewhere. Katori replied that Zakus had destroyed everything that was available out there, so there was nothing left. 
Kohaku wondered if Zakus had destroyed all of the one platinum coin swords. He further asked Katori why that had happened. Katori stated that if Kohaku wanted to know more, then he asked him for money. Kohaku gave him a gold coin. Katori further put the condition before Kohaku that he would not tell anybody that he told him that. Kohaku agreed to that and promised as well. Katori told that Zakus had a son, but he asked Kohaku how old he was. Kohaku replied that he turned 20 that year. Katori took a pause, then continued that Zakus's son would be about the same age if he was alive since he died three years ago. Moreover, he disclosed that Zakus's son, named Dacus, acquired the divine job as a swordsman at the age of 13 and became a hunter in the battle guild. However, in the beginning, that stubborn old man would not allow it. Kohaku guessed that it was because it was a job where death was always around the corner. Katori replied positively, telling that they kept having big arguments every night because of that, they would fight every day. Then one night, the son chose to leave the house after another fight. Since that day, Zakus would spend his time looking at the newspaper published by the guild every day. Katori guessed that it was because there was a list of deaths included in it, and he was sure that Zakus was worried. However, that day happened, Kohaku asked if Dacus's name was in the newspaper. Katori replied positively. He further revealed that they brought his body in later that day, but that was not the main point. Since it was the sword attack wound on his son's body, it was a sign that he was killed by a fellow human being, not by a demon, although they could only see it as another hunter murdered him. Zakus knew it just by looking at the wound that his son was killed by the sword that Zakus made himself. Kohaku remained astonished to know that. Katori stated that they were blacksmiths, and there was no way for them to ever mistake a sword attack for something else, and the most skilled craftsmen could guess what kind of weapon was used based on the slash marks. And of course, someone like Zakus would have figured it out right away. Kohaku lost in the story, Katori then concluded that was why he told him to give it up. He further added that because of his son who became a hunter, and the hunter who killed his son, and on top of all that Zakus believed that he killed his son, and presents himself for it. He said that Zakus could no longer swing his hammer anymore. Thereafter, Kohaku walked out from there. He met his familiar. Claire asked him if he thinks what Katori stated earlier was true. He replied that he did not know but, once they get back to the guild, he decided to pay Ashura a visit. Claire surely stated that Ashura might know something about it since he was a hunter in a battle guild, but she wondered if he had already returned. Kohaku told her that Ashura's party reached Race and Mine just a few hours after it got declared as a dangerous zone, so he was sure that they got away to move around in a short amount of time. After a while, they arrived at the Flame on Tamer's Guild where Saria told Kohaku that since the amount of money was quite large at that time, they could not give it to him at the front desk, so she requested him to do that in the reception room. She then gave him one platinum coin and eight gold coins for 900 kilograms of high-quality iron ore. Kohaku was surprised to see the amount, he became too happy. She further said that the market price for one kilogram of iron ore was five silver coins, but one kilogram of high-quality iron ore was worth 20 silver coins. The helper showed the next one. Kohaku wondered about the next tray that was just placed next to his tray. Sadia and the helper just took a pause and suddenly, Saria disclosed that next was the conversion for the magic crystal, and Kohaku was stunned to know that the next one was also his tray. Saria revealed that the market price for a magic crystal was one gold coin per kilogram, and there were 300 kilograms of it, so it was three platinum coins plus 80 copper coins for completing the mining request in the race and mine. She then asked him to let her put it in a separate bag, Kohaku being super happy thanked her a lot. After collecting all the money, Kohaku was thinking about what he should do with all that money. But he refused that thought, as now was not the time for it. He instantly stood up to thank them, and requested to be excused as he contemplated that he could get to the battle guild in five minutes if he ran. Afterwards, he just ran away from there and Saria remained, asking him to wait. He walked out of the room, and Saria stated that they were still not done yet, as his helper was holding something more in his hands which he covered with another hand. The scene then shifted to the battle guild, and Kohaku realized that it was a good thing they had arrived, but he could smell the alcohol and cigarettes even from there. He covered his nose because of the smell. Just then Sufia deployed the deodorant field, which gave him some relief but still not completely. Kohaku saw that two guys were having a fight there. He wondered if he would be able to find a shore in a place like that. Abruptly, someone came to him stating that he did not look familiar. He offered him an ultimate medicine, claiming that once he tasted it, his fatigue would be gone completely and he would heal instantly. He declared that he could sell it to him for 20 gold coins. Sufia told Kohaku that it was just sugar. She asked him if she should get rid of him. Kohaku refused that guy and walked forward from there. 
As he was walking around, the other guys were staring at him, and they understood that he was from the Tamer's Guild. Kohaku was contemplating that if he did not find a shore soon, he would not last. So, he just decided to look for the receptionist and ask whether he was available. Another person who seemed like a good man tried to talk to Kohaku. Some others stated that there was a bronze tamer wandering around, making fun of him that it was not the tamer's guild, and he asked Kohaku if he was lost or something. Kohaku refused, saying that it was not like that. A guy put his hand on Kohaku's shoulder, stating that he was lost, then suggested he walk him home. But in exchange, he demanded all the contents of Kohaku's bag. The others were teasing him, saying if he wanted, he could leave his clothes behind, too. Kohaku pondered that it was such a bad pattern there. Claire asked him if she could burn them all, Fenrir asked if he could bite them to death, and Sufia asked to just send their heads off real quick. Listening to all of his familiars, he thought that if he did not stop them then, he would be known as the criminal who went on a rampage in another guild. He then refused the guy for help, but that guy insisted and asked him not to be shy. Kohaku further clarified that he just wanted to talk to a certain someone from that guild, and he was not there to bother them. The guys mocked him, asking if he was sane, as a pansy-looking man, like he knew someone from that guild. They wondered who that guy was. Another person smirked, replying that there was none. Someone grabbed Kohaku's hair, bullying him, calling him a small fry and stating that a tamer like him was nothing but a disgrace to the battle guild. 